Hi YouTube. So what we're going to talk about right now is whether or not lone pairs are considered to be in hybrid orbitals or p orbitals. So many students get lost and confused in organic chemistry because their professor will tell them, oh well in that case the lone pair is in a hybrid orbital. Oh in this case it's in a p orbital. And that starts changing back and forth. So sometimes we find nitrogens that are sp3 hybridized and then based on that general rule we would think others are and then all of a sudden they become sp2 hybridized in a different scenario. So what causes this? How can I determine whether a lone pair is going to be found in a p orbital or not? All right, and there's actually a pretty easy rule for memorizing this or evaluating this. So most students understand that if I have something that is tetrahedral in its geometry, then I am typically going to be discussing sp3 hybridization, right? Now, if I have something that is trigonal planar in its geometry, I would expect sp2. And this is just sort of the normal way it's taught in general chemistry. When you breeze through hybridization, you're just taught usually, oh, well, these various molecular geometries, when you're learning the Vesper theory, are associated with these types of hybrids, right? And linear is sp. So let me show you an example of what I'm talking about here where students will get confused. If you give ammonia, which is NH3, you would expect the overall geometry here to be tetrahedral in nature. So I've got a lone pair, and then I have the three hydrogens. Now the subclass, the, the true molecular geometry, would be trigonal pyramidal in this case. But it falls underneath the sp3 tetrahedral uh, electron domain class. And we would expect that this nitrogen right here would be sp3. All right? So there... Uh, the lone pair there is going to be existing in a hybrid orbital, right? So what happens is you see other examples like this, right? You see something like water where you say here's H2O, H2O is tetrahedral, right? It's got both lone pairs right there, and so that bent subclass is still tetrahedral. We would expect that this oxygen is sp3, and that is the case, all right? So ammonia, the nitrogen in ammonia and the oxygen in water are both sp3 hybridized. So let me show you an example where students get confused with this. An instructor will then turn around and give an example like this where they say, okay, here is a functional group known as an amide. And this amide right here, they want to know the hybridization of the nitrogen. And it turns out that it's sp2. And a lot of students get confused here and they say, hold on a second. You're telling me if I look at this carbonyl, it's got a bond to the nitrogen, the nitrogen has a lone pair, and the nitrogen has two hydrogens associated with it. This looks just like ammonia as far as having three bonds and one lone pair. Why is this nitrogen not trigonal pyramidal and sp3 hybridized? That's what I would expect based on ammonia. And that's very logical, right, based on what we've seen so far. But the answer here is that these lone pairs are able to contribute in a resonance fashion to the carbonyl. So I have an alternative form that can take place here, right, where I can get a nitrogen like this, right, and then the oxygen would have the formal negative charge. It could get the extra set of electrons. So the amide, right, the nitrogen in the amide has the ability to perform or to contribute to resonance. And when we have resonance, we have a delocalization of electrons. Part of that delocalization means that this nitrogen has to be able, if you look at the structure right down here that I'm squaring, this nitrogen has to be able to participate in a pi bond. Okay. Now when we think about pi bonds, pi bonds take place in p orbitals. So when I have a carbon-carbon double bond, right, the single bond takes place in a hybridized orbital, but the double bond is going to take place in the p orbital that gets left behind. And that's why whenever we have a carbon involved in a double bond, it's trigonal planar, and we would normally call it sp2, because we have to leave a p orbital behind in order for the pi electrons to form that double bond. Well, in this case, the nitrogen, right, is going to be participating in the resonance with its lone pair. So the only way that it can actively participate in resonance and form pi electrons going back and forth is to have a p orbital available 
to participate in that. And that's exactly what happens. The nitrogen in the amide holds on to a p orbital and only becomes sp2 hybridized because it's really involved in a delocalization of that lone pair. The lone pair doesn't exist right on top of nitrogen like it would in ammonia, in which case we would see sp3 hybridization. All right, so to sort of give you a hard fast rule, if you ever find a lone pair on any type of atom that is one space away okay from a pi bond so look at the pi bond here okay if you have one space away so this lone pair is one space away from a pi bond then the lone pair will exist in a p orbital so this is not both lone pairs keep in mind that when you're talking about this okay you can only fit two pi electrons into a p orbital right we put one spin up and one spin down so your lone pair will be in a p orbital in a case like this doesn't matter which one you pick when you're dealing with the oxygen here the other one would be in a hybridized orbital so you have a lone pair in the p orbital and that's because it's going to participate in resonance because one of the alternate forms that i could have here would look like this okay. and so i would expect that this oxygen because it's participating in resonance is going to be sp2 hybridized right now let's take a look at another example in a nitrogen right imagine that i have a nitrogen right here and then imagine that i also have an example that looks like this Uh, let's actually draw that out like the other one okay in an example like this one of the one of these would be sp2 the other would be sp3 so in this case this nitrogen with this lone pair here is going to be one space away from the double bond and so i would expect the hybridization here to be sp2 because again that lone pair needs to exist in a p orbital in order to participate in resonance in this case if the nitrogen tried to move here i'm one two bonds away two carbons or two spaces away from being able to reach that pi bond so this cannot participate in resonance there's no need to form a pi bond with that lone pair and so that lone pair will exist in a hybrid orbital and this would be sp3 hybridized Right? You can do the same thing even for carb what we would call carbanions or a carboanion. So if I have a carboanion like this, okay, this carboanion would be sp2. Whereas if I had a carbanion like this, this carbanion would be sp3. The lone pair could not contribute or participate in resonance and so it goes into a hybrid orbital that's really the key if you have a lone pair on any atom carbon oxygen nitrogen if you have a lone pair on any atom and that lone pair is one space away okay from a pi bond be it a triple bond a double bond anything like that you have the potential for resonance and then this becomes sp2 because the lone pair hangs out in a p orbital so the time this comes up most often just to sort of bring this to a conclusion is especially in ochem 2 when you're trying to determine aromatic structures so you're going through huckel's rule you're going through all these other sort of classifications to see if something's aromatic or not and then you'll get to a structure like this okay so actually let me i'm just going to delete some room here so you'll come across a structure like this and you'll have a ring and you'll have a nitrogen like this right and then the nitrogen let's say the nitrogen has a hydrogen on it and it's got a lone pair and you meet the fact that it's cyclic and it's conjugated so if you want more details on that there's a video on um, determining if something's aromatic or not okay but you come to this point and you're trying to determine how many pi electrons are in the conjugated system and you say okay i've got two of them from this double bond i've got two of them from this double bond and then students wonder do these 
loan pairs, right, does this loan pair contribute to the pi electrons in the system? And the answer here would be yes, because if I, again, look at this structure, the nitrogen, okay, is one space away from double bonds, which means it could contribute like this using resonance, and I could create a resonance form with that nitrogen in order to help delocalize the electrons, right? So I could get something like this. And so yes, this nitrogen would have these electrons in a p orbital, and they would count as pi electrons because they would be a part of the system, all right? So hopefully this lecture helps to clear up when we determine if lone pairs are gonna be found in hybrid orbitals or if they are going to be found in p orbitals. Again, the key here is a lone pair can go into a p orbital and will go into a p orbital if it has the ability to participate in resonance and sort of conjugate with the system to delocalize electro, uh, electron charge. So that covers lone pairs and where we find them. This is really, I'm sort of designing this as part of the aromaticity lectures and whether something's aromatic, but this information could be useful if you're just sort of, you know, trying to determine hybridization of atoms when there's lone pairs involved, because that can get confusing for some students. So thank you so much for your support for the channel. Remember, likes and subscriptions always help in terms of producing new content. Uh, if you leave comments, I'm happy to get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks so much for learning with us, and we will see you guys for future lectures. Bye.